Hi, I'm Dennis Hayes. Back in 1970, I was the national coordinator of the first Earth Day and the founder of the Earth Day Network. Um, we called it Earth Day back in 1970, but in reality, it wasn't about the Earth. It was about the United States environment. Uh, it was at a time when the American environment had deteriorated rapidly. The air in cities like Gary, Indiana, or Pittsburgh, or Los Angeles, very much like the air today in New Delhi. Uh, people who simply were there breathing were taking the equivalent of smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. Uh, we had rivers that were catching on fire. The Great Lakes were dying. Our national emblem, the bald eagle, was endangered, as were many other species. We were having some major oil spills on our beaches, um, freeways cutting through vibrant inner city neighborhoods, lead paint peeling off the walls and uh, poor neighborhoods and being eaten by children uh, with the lead then damaging their brains and their nervous systems. Um, pesticides bringing all kinds of problems to agriculture and to those who consumed it. And it just went on and on and on with a, a litany of woes. But at that point, uh, people who were worried about each of those individual issues tended not to think of them as a package. Um, the environment was not something that was well understood as a basket of issues. Rather, the people who were worried about freeways cutting through their neighborhoods were anti-freeway people. The people who were worried about decimated bird populations were bird people. People worried about oil were worried about just oil. And what we did with Earth Day was to lump all of these things, literally dozens of issues together within a common values framework, and try to make everyone understand that if they would work together on one another's issues, they would be much stronger than if each of them just focused very narrowly upon their own. In the end, it turned out to be spectacularly successful. We had more than 20 million people who participated in the first Earth Day. And remember, this is at a time when there were no computers, there was no internet, there was no social media, we didn't have cell phones. In fact, we could barely afford regular phones. We had only one line that you can make, uh, make um, out-of-town calls on. Uh, this was all done by mail and addressograph machines, but, but it hit an enormously resounding chord with the American public, and, and we had almost one out of ten Americans participating. In the immediate aftermath of Earth Day, after dominating the news then for a couple of weeks, uh, President Nixon invaded Cambodia, and then shortly after that there was a, a, a confrontation on a college campus where several students at Kent State University were shot and killed. And the attention on the environment just diminished dramatically. Where we'd been front page above the fold, uh, suddenly we were buried way back in the paper and, and the escalating war in Southeast Asia once again dominated the news. Our effort that fall was to um, find a way to bring it back. And our instrument toward that end was to become involved in politics. The uh, campaign that I was heading then announced a dirty dozen campaign going after 12 members of Congress who had truly despicable environmental records. And we uh, launched a campaign, almost no money, but a lot of enthusiasm against incumbents who are the most difficult people to defeat in politics because money tends to flow to the people who are already in office. But we had good activist groups in each of their congressional districts, and in the end, we defeated seven out of 12, including a hugely powerful chairman of the House Public Works Committee, the guy who decided if you wanted to have a new public building, if you wanted a bridge, if you wanted a highway, uh, what we call in American politics, uh, pork. <laughs> uh, when we defeated the chairman of the House Public Works Committee, it was like a shot heard around Capitol Hill, that this environment thing was not just a bunch of people out there protesting and planting trees and making the world slightly better as individuals, but it was, in addition to that, a political force. In the immediate aftermath of that, we passed the Clean Air Act, which was a really profoundly important and far-reaching piece of legislation that was vigorously opposed by the coal industry, the oil industry, the automobile industry, the steel industry, the electric utility industry, uh, despite all of that opposition, it passed unanimously on a voice vote in the U.S. Senate, and it passed with only one dissenting vote out of 435 members of the House of Representatives. 
Uh, moving forward, uh, we fairly rapidly then passed a Clean Water Act, uh, an Endangered Species Act, uh, Toxic Substances Control Act, uh, legislation addressing pesticides, uh, a Marine Mammal Protection Act, a super fund to clean up uh, places that had been contaminated often decades in the past and were now leaking out and causing problems. Uh, we banned DDT, we banned lead in paint, we banned lead in gasoline, we set up fuel efficiency standards for automobiles. And for the next 10 years, we became almost unstoppable as a political force. It was uh, a, a truly amazing period in American society that caused tens of trillions of dollars to be spent differently than they would have been spent, but for this legislation and the resulting rulemaking and regulations. And because it was all subjected to benefit cost analysis, the nation was better off for having spent that money this way than if it had not. Uh, whenever something happens that is hugely successful in American politics, it always seems to generate a reaction, sort of like a pendulum. You pull it far enough one direction and it will sweep back the other direction. So after an enormous amount of success, uh, through the 1970s, and in fact, Earth Day 1980 was largely congratulatory, uh, talking about all of the things we'd accomplished. In the fall of, of 1980, uh, we elected a new president, and Ronald Reagan, who was an anti-environmentalist, replaced Jimmy Carter, who was very much a pro-environmentalist. Carter, in fact, had a goal of getting 20% of all energy in the United States from renewable resources by the year 2000. And it was my job as the head of the Solar Energy Research Institute to design the plan to get there. And had it been implemented, I'm confident we would have gotten there. And if we'd received that kind of an accomplishment um, by the year 2000, I think by 2020, uh, the climate issue would be uh, much, much less because it would have been leadership to the entire world saying, we can do this, the technology exists and it's affordable. However, Reagan basically shut down that program. He installed a Secretary of Interior and a head of the EPA whose names became synonymous with anti-environmental zealotry. And then for the next decade, the, the pendulum swung the other direction and uh, many of the accomplishments of the previous 10 years um, were overturned. At the end of that, uh, moving into uh, the now 1990, um, the next Earth Day was sort of a protest. And sort of, instead of celebrating what had been accomplished, this time we were protesting all of the losses that we'd had the previous 10 years. And in the election after that, uh, it was Bill Clinton and Al Gore. Gore being actually a, a bona fide environmentalist as the vice president of the United States and brought in strong proponents uh, in the Department of Interior and in the EPA and, and elsewhere. And the pendulum just keeps swinging. Clinton and Gore were very pro-environment, and George W. Bush was, along with Dick Cheney, anti-environment, and then Barack Obama was pro-environment. And Now with Donald Trump, we've got a very anti-environmental president. And it, it we've managed to ratchet it up a little bit each time so that when it's rolled back, nonetheless, at the end of the anti-environmental periods, uh, we nonetheless were able to keep some of the significant progress that had previously been made. So, for example, if you buy a gasoline, a petrol-driven automobile today in the United States, it produces only 2% of the pollution, the smog-producing pollutions, the nitrous oxides, the ozone particulates, uh, that it did in 1970. So we've reduced that then by 98%. And, uh, and in area after area, we have made significant gains and ratcheted them in. This all with regard to mostly issues that are United States issues that can be legislated by our Congress and by our state legislatures and by our uh, municipal governments and um, can be enforced by the Justice Department, by the EPA, by officials within our borders. But as we move now and have been now for the last quarter century into issues that are much more international in their dimensions, uh, things such as climate change, um, endangered species that migrate over national borders so that you can do whatever you want to to save their habitat in one country, unless you're saving their habitat in all the countries that they pass through, uh, they're going to be going extinct. Or problems of the deep oceans, uh, whether it's overfishing, ocean acidification, bottom trawling, uh, 
all of these things are things that cannot be solved by any one country acting by itself. It requires global cooperation. It requires all nations to jump into it together. As we get into this era where these big issues, and by far the dominant one being climate change, require uh, international standards, international goals, and international enforcement, it has all been arriving at a time when the world seems to be having a resurgence of nationalism. In, in my country, President Trump is all about America first, uh, but you see a similar sort of attitude in Russia, uh, in China, uh, in Turkey, uh, in the Philippines, in, in countries around the world. Some would say there's a bit of that in India as well. Um, and that makes it very difficult to get countries to work together cooperatively, sometimes in ways that disadvantage them. That's to say, uh, leapfrogging over uh, the period where most of the currently highly industrialized countries had depended upon coal to generate power and are now moving increasingly into renewables, a great deal of money, uh, both in generating capacity and particularly in transmission and distribution, can be saved by jumping directly to renewables without passing through that intermediate stage. But there's this inclination to say, we want to follow the same path. We too want to be burning a lot of coal. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, it, it contributes to those greenhouse gases that uh, are causing problems for the entire planet. Because it, it just makes no difference at all whether you burn a ton of coal in Germany or in China or in India or the United States, the climate impacts are precisely the same. And so we have to come together as a species. We have to come together as homo sapiens to address these global issues. And we don't have very much uh, success at doing that. A current issue, of course, is COVID-19. And that's an example of what might be taken as, as doing things right. There's a great deal of international respect for the World Health Organization. It's viewed as nonpartisan. It's viewed as having scientific expertise that people should be paying attention to. And when it suggests that countries do something, they tend to do it. And, and it's my hope that we can learn from that in the climate realm as well and, and in these other international environmental issues. Uh, now, COVID-19 requires things like um, uh, resting in your homes for a period, uh, segregating anyone who has caught the disease from uh, being able to uh, infect others. Ultimately, it's going to depend upon uh, developing vaccines that are effective against it. All things considered, relatively easy to accomplish versus completely changing the energy uh, mix for modern industrial societies worldwide, which is what we need to be doing as, as the most important single element of a strategy around climate change. Though it needs to involve forestation, it needs to involve uh, sensible diets, it needs to involve vastly more efficient buildings and transportation systems. Ultimately, we have to be getting a fundamental change in energy and that is going to be difficult to achieve against some existing economic interests that don't want it to happen, that have tens of trillions of dollars of coal and oil and gas in the ground that they count on their books as assets. And if we can't pull them out of the ground, they become stranded assets and reduce the value of the companies. And so they have been fighting heroically against effective efforts to move on climate. What does this all lead us to? Um, how do I turn this presentation from something that is uh, a little bit bleak into something that is hopeful? And I, I think there are all kinds of signs, not just COVID-19, but in a variety of places where we have begun to understand that there are things that need to be addressed as a species. I'm of the belief that all species, including Homo sapiens, has hardwired within it biologically a recognition that we need to move to protect the species itself, that it's not all just about the individual interests of individuals, but rather that we are looking out for all of the others of our species. It's, it's true across the board with plants and animals where there's an individual sacrifice for the benefit of the whole. And if we can be doing that as, if, if human beings can be as smart as trees are, uh, then we've got, I, I think, a fairly broadened uh, 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 encouraging future. 
Again, it, it has really been a pleasure to be with you today, at least digitally. Um, the work that you've done with the Sanctuary Nature Foundation and Book My Show in this field is, is extraordinary. And we at the Earth Day Network are proud and pleased to be partnering with you in this effort.